Greetings and welcome to the Frank Silvera Writers Workshop New Play Reading Series. Special thanks to the Billy Holiday Theater for partnering with us to make this reading possible. Immediately following this reading, there'll be a moderated critique session where you can offer direct feedback about what you just watched to the playwright. And now, we're so pleased to present Shakespeare Over My Shoulder, written and directed by Ted Land. Shakespeare Over My Shoulder by Ted Lange. Scene one. Scene opens in London's Mermaid Tavern. The Earl of Oxford is writing. Shakespeare is wearing a long scarf, which works as a mask covering his mouth and nose. The scarf is to protect against the plague. Shakespeare watches Oxford, looking over Oxford's shoulder for a moment. Why are you standing there? What are you working on? A poem. Shakespeare sits next to him and takes off his mask. No, I mean a play. I need a play. Shouldn't we keep our social distance? You look healthy. We're good. After the play, when the theaters reopen, I do not want to scrounge for work. Are you working on any new plays? This play... This play is giving us a little more time to hone our work. I've scribbled a few notes. I've got an idea that I think has promise. Well, is there a role for me? My money is low, Oxford. I want to do one of your plays. It's too soon to tell, still developing it. Well, what have you got so far? Tell me, I bet I can play a role. I'm good enough to tear apart to passions. Oh, Shakespeare, I heard thee speak me a speech once, but it was not acted. Was it lofty? I am known to make my speeches lofty. I, I think you saw the air too much thus. Well, not I. For certainty, I speak my words trippingly on the tongue. I think you are a robustuous periwig-pated fellow, friend Shakespeare. Sometimes you tear a passion to tatters, to very rags. But not with good writing. You, Oxford, are a wonderful writer. I saw Merlot's Tamburlaine, not as good as your writing. I helped him with that. I could tell that is when the verse started to sing. I would do your words wonderful justice. Why are you out and about? Shouldn't you be home? I've cleaned my room three times in five days. Sitting in a room watching the same four walls can drive a man crazy. I rearrange my furniture twice, and every time I looked out my window, empty streets, I need people. Well, it's not a good thing to need during a pandemic. I keep my distance. I will also need a job when this plague has ended. Friend, Oxford, I'm really good at soliloquies. <laughs> you? Suit the action to the word, the word to the action. An unrelenting yes, a hundred times yes. No, a thousand times yes. I say opportunity is the essential gift to any thespian, but as hard to find as an agate stone. What is this new play you write? A comedy centered on twins. Well, my chief humor is to play a tragedy, yet... I could do a comedy. I can squeeze a laugh. I like the sound of laughter wafting up from the groundlings. Yes, this I might do well if you cast me in your play. Which twin would I play? Shakespeare, I haven't assigned you a role. But who are the twins? I'm adapting Plautus. Not just one set of twins, but two sets of twins. Excellent idea. Mm, you'll say anything to get a part. True, but... This does not mean it isn't a good idea. I recognize talent. I can find another actor that looks like me. One set of twins is named Antiphilus of Ephesus and Antiphilus of Syracuse. To contrast their servants, Dromeo of Ephesus and Dromeo of Syracuse. <laughs> Farce! I'm laughing already. Let me play Dromeo. Of Ephesus or Syracuse? You choose. No, I have an actor in mind, but maybe you could play Pinch. What is Pinch? A lover or a tyrant? He's a schoolmaster. 
worthy role for a worthy actor. So you say, can you act literate? It's all pretend. I'm better than any pretender to the throne or a classroom. Then I'll keep you in mind for any future production. Uh, loan me a shilling for a drink. My throat cries out for me. Oxford gives him a shilling. I, I meant to say, give me a shilling. Shaxborough wraps his scarf around his mouth and goes to the bar. Oxford continues writing. Christopher Marlowe enters. He is wearing a long scarf which covers his mouth and nose. He looks around and sits at the table with Oxford. Oxford, what are you doing out? Working on a new poem. I needed exercise and a change of scenery. Luckily, this is one of the few taverns open. Oxford, I'm working on a new play, but with the plague shutting down the cockpit, I think I need a gimmick to bring audiences back to the theater. What's the, what's the play? I'm calling it The Jew of Malta. What is this fascination you have with Jews? I don't think it's a fascination. They just make great characters in telling a story. Oh, great characters. Didn't you write another play where you had a Jewish character? Uh, I haven't finished that play yet. I'm going to produce this play first. Maybe later I may produce the Shylock character in another play. Right now, I am fleshing out this Jew, Barabbas. I am using him as the main character for this play. It's so easy to draw a conflict through the Jewish lifestyle. Well, I don't need a Jew to draw a conflict for my plays. Oxford, the great thing about writing about Jews is no one in England has seen them since 1299. There's no point of reference, so I can write whatever I want. I've seen a Jew as recently as last week. No, you haven't. Yes, I have. There are Jews living here secretly. How do you know the person you saw was a Jew? I felt the horns on his head. <laughs> Proves nothing. Muranos is what they call themselves. A Jew will tell you he's a Jew if they trust you. You're trustworthy. And I can keep a secret. The only secret you can keep is a truth you don't know. Oh, I know your benefactor. The queen? Well, her too. I'm also speaking of Roger Manwood. Deny it. Mr. Manwood. How do you know he's the benefactor? When you went to court for killing someone in a street brawl, what was your punishment? Oxford, you are black. I'm what? You are black. I am black. You are the kettle and I am the pot. The kettle calling the pot black. Exactly. Where did you quarrel with uh, Philip Sidney? On a tennis court in Whitehall. Ah, yes, the tennis court. It was a minor argument, and it was resolved. And uh, how did you get that limp you try to compensate for? Everyone knows I got it in a street fight. An argument with uh, Sir Thomas Nivet? That, too, has been resolved and the wound in my leg proves it. So, I think you do not have enough ground to stand on to reprimand me. Now, William Bradley was not killed by me. I was there, but I did not strike the blow that ended his life. Tom Watson and I were minding our own business when Bradley got a notion in his head. He could take Tom. Never fight with a swordsman who is better than you. Tom is a master. Bradley drew his sword, I stepped back, and Tom made swift work of defeating his opponent. I think Tom let Bradley wound him, for after he did, Tom pierced him through the heart. Tom's wound helped our case, and the judge saw the injustice of the situation. But I struck no blow to hurt or kill William Bradley. How subject we young men are to this vice of fighting. 
let us say that no one knows better than you of this vice. Oxford, I was innocent, and I do not have the favor of the queen to advocate for me. No, just a judge. Who better to assist in a courtroom trial than the weight of a judge? Marlowe, the truth can bend. A judge sits on the bend, weighs the evidence with his own values, not the law. Who was the judge that sat on the bench for your trial? Uh, Roger Manwood. Aha! I rest my case. It is a dangerous game you play, and if you continue to play, you may end up dead sooner than later. Or with a limp like mine, there will not always be a Manwood to guide circumstances. And remember, the queen can be manipulated. There is artistry to this game. Like backgammon, you roll the dice, but those numbers do not determine the end of your game. Strategy determines the outcome. Position, experience, and a little luck. Less luck than you might imagine. If you play the game without emotion, you can win. You are as a candle, the better part burned out. How many characters in your new play? Near 20. And how many women? Got some nuns, an abbess, a daughter, and of course, a courtesan. Of course. I have a gimmick for you. Innovative, yet secure. My ears cry out for security. Let women play the female roles. <laughs> oh, Oxford, I'm serious, and you decide to induce my laughter. Marlowe, you must take my tone. I lay at your feet an ingenious idea. What could be more fascinating to see you on stage than an actual female attempting to portray her gender? You would be innovative. I have obligations to my boys. This isn't about obligations. It's about art. Think of the controversies your play would generate. First whispers, then passionate talk, then angry debates. Debates would turn into attendance and ultimately guilders in your coffers. The question is, do you want to be in the forefront as a playwright and producer? To be or not to be, that is the question. I ask you for a simple suggestion and you give me revolution. I don't need the aggravation. Someday it'll happen. Someday a woman will share the stage with a man. Be a man ahead of his time, Kit. Would you do it? Would you give a woman a role in one of your plays? Hell no, but I'm not looking for a gimmick. I need a better idea. You're letting your private parts dictate your art. You shouldn't be involved with any of your young, nubile actors. Buggery can be dangerous. Politics. It's politics, simply unavoidable. Restraint and discipline. Keep your pantaloons up and you avoid politics. Those castrati you love so well will be your Achilles heel. I can think of a hundred reasons why a woman would be a disaster on stage. Give me three. Pardon me. Give me three reasons you think a woman on stage would prove a detriment to the execution of one of your plays. It's common sense. It's simplicity itself. First, they don't have the instrument to articulate their gender. No voice. I need an actor to reach the back row of the cockpit theater. Their voice will not have the melodious volume to reach the last seat in the last row in the balcony. Words will be lost, consonants will be dropped, and vowels will be blurred. And Oxford, can a woman really understand the poetry of my iambic pentameter? I think not. There is a physical strength that a woman cannot sustain over the core of the evening, the run of the show. A woman is frail, dainty, and inherently weak. How can they stand up to the natural strength of one folksy boy? I know a lady in waiting strong as a bull. There are boys that are better women than some of the women I know. They have studied, practiced, and perfected the attitudes of a woman. Oxford, 
I've got to introduce you to some of my lady friends. Mm, I look forward to the day. There are boys that are better women than some of the women I know. Maybe. I'll pass on that invitation. Third, and most important, a woman does not have the talent to create a full-rounded female emotional depth of character. Then how can you write her? Any woman that likes, enjoys, or wants to be around the theater is a lady of ill repute, a strumpet any decent gentleman would shun. Every gentleman knows this, and it will color their character with the reality of their world. The theater tends to attract trollops and harlots. I would need a woman who can play royalty as well as a peasant. Can a harlot play a gentlewoman? I think not. I need the audience to get lost in the story I'm trying to tell. If, frankly, there aren't any women talented enough to actually play a woman. Your theory almost works. Not a theory, Oxford, not a theory, a fact. Well, then you better tell the Italians because they've been putting women on stage for 30 years. <laughs> he slubbering balderdash. Have you been to Italy? Holland and France, my friend. I tend to avoid the South. Well, next opportunity travels South. I suggest Venice. <laughs> Italians. Putting a woman on stage. Churlish pinbutt idiots. Why don't you do it, Oxford? Young Sophocles, you are the up-and-coming playwright. It falls on your shoulders to carry that weight. If I should do it, you need to do it. No, I must work in the theater with a hidden hand. It wouldn't be prudent for the Earl of Oxford to innovate the theater or to draw attention to my involvement. Whereas with I you- I understand, whereas I have no such claims to high society, especially royal society. I'm just the son of a poor shoemaker. And therefore, since I'm still establishing myself from my humble beginnings, it falls to me to push the art form forward. Who better than you to introduce the English audience to new possibilities? You have not put your name on any play you've written. True, but certain royal personalities are hearing rumors, and I find myself in a dilemma. If I desire to continue, I must... I must find a mask to cover my face. Hurts, doesn't it? Art, no credit. Yet art just the same. The social politics of royalty bear no weight on my achievements. Thank goodness my father was a shoe repairman. You are the bright and shining star of London's theater. Your verse is magical, structure impeccable, and actors like Edward Allen seek you out. I see a future for you, Marlowe, but don't try to sell me the shoe repairman fantasy. What are you implying? <laughs> you are college educated. What college did you attend? Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, class of 87. So are you telling me your father made enough money to send you to college? Of course not. I had a benefactor. May I ask who sponsored you? You may ask, but wait not for the answer today. Francis Bacon enters the tavern. He wears a long scarf over his mouth. Ah, Marlowe, I've been looking for you. And fortune smiles on you today. Good to see you, Sir Edward. You too, Bacon. How much longer do we have to survive this <clears throat> plague? Quarantine. 40 days are up. We just have to use caution and common sense. Marla, I talked to the queen. Your life is in danger. Mm. Hazards of being the queen's spy. There's a plot brewing against you. You must be aware of the Privy Council. The queen has asked me to assist you in helping with your rescue. So, do I join your Rosicrucians? Yes. We must devise a romantic death for you. The Rosicrucians will guide you to a safe destination. Not sure I want to do that. What fates impose that men must needs abide. 
it boots not to resist both wind and tide. Clever and poetic, but I'm not doing it. I'm not going to disappear just because London gets a little hot in the spring. I like the tropics. I can handle the situation. The Privy Council is plotting your demise. Jacob wants you dead. Bacon, I'm in the middle of a very profitable career. I'm the brightest star in the firmament. My plays are quite popular. I am even thinking of putting women on the stage. I want to innovate the theater. I have not reached my prime and you want to cut me off? It's not me, it's the queen, it's the crown. You really want to end up dead? If you let me, we can fake your death. You have made some very powerful people angry. They're not imaginary. Tis real, but your death doesn't have to be. Blank verse. My reasons lie in the written word. Blank verse. I'm getting quite good at it. I used to hate writing. Now I can't wait to put pen to paper. Well, I understand your passion. I write too. Men are sometimes masters of their fates. No, you don't understand. You think you understand. I've got a trunk full of plays, blank verse. I'm creating an art form. Who else is doing this? Me, I'm doing this. Not as good as I'm doing it. I will give you credit for writing some wonderful words, but you are not the only star in the heavens. Oxford, I can write you under the table. Oh, you think you can? Blank verse is not your private toy. Once it becomes popular, think you other writers will not be able to master it? Marlowe, pick your poison and move to the back of the line. Oxford, I have had great success with my plays. Dido, Queen of Carthage, and what, Massacre at Paris? Notable, but not the huge successes you claim. Dido was my first play, and I was just getting my footing. And Massacre in Paris was a little too controversial for the Queen. But I am learning the politics of writing. Tamburlaine the Great, Edward II, vastly different subject matter handled by a master. Big successes, deny it. We will not witness anything if Jacob Rees Mogg has his way. He wants your head. It's the boy, isn't it? What boy? The boy in your troop. You don't want to leave the boy. Your passion will get you killed. You're in the wrong road, in the wrong city, at the wrong time. I'm a genius, and the general public is starting to acknowledge it. I'm gaining a reputation, and I like how it feels. Stubborn little sodomite, isn't he? You're spinning in the wind, Oxford. And who is that Italian boy that cooks for you and lives in your home? Whose bed does he sleep in? Once again, Kettle calls the pot black. Fame is a dangerous mistress, Marlow. It's a cannibal that eats your soul. She takes the best part of your talent and inflates your mind with self-importance. Genius. <laughs> Sir Francis, name another playwright that writes as well as me. I am not bragging. I am looking at the cold, hard facts of talent. Right now, there is a turning point. Someone has got to lead the pack. Someone has got to set the tone and make the rules for what constitutes good playwriting. Now, I have discovered I am very good at blank verse. This is an art form just now emerging. Give the devil his due and give me my accolades. You fall into the abyss of overconfidence. She makes you think you are stronger than you actually are. Fills your dreams with gold, magnifies your mirror with images of overwhelming power. Be careful, Marlo. Even mature men have been kissed by fame and lost their mind in the scent of her perfume. Fame will suck all the idealism out of your brain. Protect your talent. Taste the moment. But don't build on its foundation. Secure your future so that the world will enjoy your talent. Don't let that cunt fame trick you. She's satanic and hungry, and wants to control your future. Defy her. She will infect your friends and your family. Make them feel like you owe them. 
they will demand their fair share of your spoils. Ah, yes, Marley, you think you can handle that bitch, but believe me, I've seen how she can devastate a man's soul and well-being and warp his mind. Take the offer. I am my own man, Bacon. You must die. Question is, where do you want your phoenix to rise? I promised Edward Allen my new play. And we will make sure he gets it. You don't understand. I, I want to see him act in it. You don't understand. You won't be alive to see him act in anything. If you follow my plan, you'll live to write another play. If you don't, all plays die with you. Where do you want to rise again? I have to think about this. You are asking a lot of a man who just came out to break the boredom of the plague and come have a drink and maybe play a game of backgammon. Marlowe puts on his mask, then gets up and leaves. Youth. All swagger. Very little substance. What are you writing? A poem. What's it called? Venus and Adonis. Mm. May I see it? Oxford hands Bacon a few pages. Bacon reads it. You're not going to publish this, are you? I was thinking uh, maybe I could. No, no, you can't. Surely you're not seriously going to publish this. D didn't the queen in the 80s arrest you for treason? She thought you were Catholic? Oh, we're past that. I'm back in her good graces. In this poem, Venus, is she not the queen? Yes, she is. Well, publish this and you'll be out of her good graces. She's being misguided by her advisors. Oxford, you can get her a message, but not this way. Well, she has to know. How else can I get her to listen without Lord Burley whispering in her ear? Devere. Hmm. You need a beard. Actually, we need a beard. I have some plays I want to publish. I've said some things that I should not, that should not be linked to me. Your poem, Venus and Adonis, if, if, if this comes from you, you risk losing any royal position you've gained. It will come back on your family. How's your daughter? Not my daughter. She's my wife's daughter. I'm sorry, I forgot she was born while you were in Venice. <sighs> I'm trying to be a bigger man. But when I look at her face, I, I don't see her mother or me. It's hard. I want to be a mean son of a bitch. I want revenge. I... Didn't you get your revenge with your affair to Lady Anne Vavasour? No. I got a wound in my leg by her brother Thomas, which gives me this unsightly limp. Oxford, we need to find someone not too bright. Someone who loves the theater and the prospect of being a writer. A man we can manipulate shower with praise and front for our artistic output of literary works. Oxford looks around the room. He sees someone and calls him over. Oh, uh, Shakespeare. Oh, uh, William Shakespeare, please come and join us. <laughs> William Shakespeare comes over and sits at Oxford's table. He sips his drink. William, we have a proposition for you. Rolled in one of your plays? No, not my plays. Your plays. I am lost. Uh, what is the proposition? You like my writing. I love your writing. I write poetry too, but at this moment I have a dilemma. I feel that only you can help. Me? Uh, more than Sir Francis Bacon? Yes, only you. But... I am not a gentleman such as yourselves. You all have money, position, titles. I am just a poor thespian looking for a role. Oh, we have a role for you to play. Quite a unique one. The role of a lifetime, quite literally. I am most confused, gentlemen. Who has written the role? Uh, you, Mr. DeVere? Not I, William. Oh, you, Mr. Bacon? <laughs> not I, William. Well, then, gentlemen, I am at a total loss for what we are talking about. 
We would like to impose on your good name. Well, I am awaiting for this mystery to conclude. Gentlemen, please arrive at a point so that clarity will issue forth. What are you asking? How would you like to make a tidy sum? Annually. The answer is yes, whatever it is. William Shakespeare. Such a forceful name. Simply rolls off the tongue. We need a beard. A surrogate. A young fellow traveler such as yourself <clears throat> at the start of your London theatrical career. Surely you could use a little guidance. I am not opposed to advice. I've written a poem which I want to publish. I cannot put my name on it as author, but it must be credited. The Earl of Oxford is willing to pay you for the use of your name. This may make you famous and hence easier to land roles in new plays. Famous? Yes. As gentlemen, we cannot write our stories and say what we have to say. We want to be free to express our thoughts and ideas and not worry about the social peers getting a sense of where the wind is blowing from. We want to camouflage ourselves so that curious minds don't wander back to us. However, if we place your name on the bill... Our friends would wonder how you knew so much about royal situations, and it would leave us free to comment on politics and our social order without drawing attention to us. See? Simple. Because I'm a commoner, royal situations, politics, social order, are you going to libel someone? No, of course not. Feel safe, William. We, we just want to send messages to our royal circle of friends. But we want to remain anonymous. And here's the best part. We will pay you. Money for you to put your name on our plays. Or say an epic poem. And if some noble person asks you where you got the idea about a scene or some witty dialogue, the your answer will be, I just... Use my imagination. I am a, a student of human nature. I have a good eye for well-written characters, and you will pay me for this. Oh, handsomely. And we will let you put your name on a Kit Marlowe play. No shit. I think uh, we could have found a wittier way to express it, but uh, <laughs> yes. He won't mind? I can honestly say he will be at a loss for words. And if Edward de Vere writes the play, you will put my name on it as author. Yes. And if I write a play, the name Francis Bacon will be replaced with William Shakespeare? Light seeking light. Death light of light beguile. Yeah, whatever that means. And you both will pay me for the use of my name. Yes. Gentlemen. It's a deal. I would like, however, to change the spelling of your surname. I'd like to add two letters, A and E. Shake a pair? Shakespeare. Francis, don't you think Shakespeare's has a nice ring to it? And it reminds me of the muse, Diana, shaking her spear. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a poetic touch. I think we should celebrate, and you should both buy me a drink. I'll get a picture. He gets up and goes to the bar. A little too eager? Mm, I hope this doesn't turn around and bite us on the arse. Well, if we're not careful, this upstart crow is going to actually want to write a play. End of Act One. Act Two. Scene One. Shakespeare will be referred to as Shakespeare from this point on. Shakespeare is sitting at a table. He has a manuscript in front of him. He is flipping through the pages. Edward de Vere enters. He is wearing a long scarf. He limps when he walks. He sits with Shakespeare. Eddie, Eddie, we've uh, got to talk. Eddie? Did you hear about Kit Marlowe? He's dead. <gasps> When did this happen? Last Wednesday. How did it happen? He was stabbed to death by some body-serving man. They were 
drunk, got into a fight at the widow Eleanor Bull's tavern, and this guy, Ingram, stabbed Marlowe. Stabbed him. They got into an argument over who was going to pay the bill. Well, that's terrible. Oh, such a such a talent wasted, <laughs> gone. Such a talent. <laughs> yes, that's how I feel. I always wanted to be in one of his plays. Looks like that is never going to happen now. Well, we, we do know he was a bit of a hothead. He could fly off the handle. Speaking of talent, I need to talk to you. Yes? Look, I, I can't let you put my name on this play. What are you talking about? This play is not ready to be produced. It needs another rewrite. Shakespeare, your job is not to help me write plays. It's to let me use your name. That's why I pay you handsomely, I might add. Yes, 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 I, I know. But seriously, look at this scene. What scene? Act three, scene four. The scene about the black guy's handkerchief. He's really mad with his wife because she can't show him the handkerchief. Her servant, Amelia, is just standing there listening, listening to the black amour, raving mad at his wife. I, I think we need to rewrite this scene. We? You're not writing this play. I am. I'm just using your name. Yes, yes, yes. I, I know. But hear me out. You've got this Othello guy asking for the handkerchief, and his wife, Desdemona, lies and says she has it. She lies to her husband. It's part of the plot. The scene has to turn there. Yes, but all Amelia has to do is say, I found the handkerchief and gave it to my husband, but she doesn't. The logic of the scene falls apart. Instead, Amelia is silent. She watches this mad black guy raving at his beautiful white wife, and Amelia stays silent. It, it, does that sound logical to you? Don't worry. It will work. You think the groundlings are going to believe that? You think they're not going to question why? Why doesn't she speak up? Shakespeare, your job is not to write the plays. I only let you read it as a courtesy so you can be prepared when others ask you about the plot or characters. Maybe I should stop. Wait, no, no, I understand, but I'm still going to have to ask questions. I have to be up top of the play. Do you really think Englishmen are going to believe a black moor is a soldier leading white men? Where did you get this idea anyway? First of all, he's not just a soldier. He's a general, a famous mercenary. And it's quite a famous story in Italy. It's a novella written by Giovanni Battista Giraldi. Never heard of it. Oh. Cynthia? Of course you haven't. But that's not important. What is important is that it's a great story from a popular Italian novella. Well, if it's so popular, how come it didn't come to England? I'm bringing it to England in my play. But what's the name of the novella? Hecatomethi. Never heard of it. Of course you haven't. Have you ever traveled out of England? No. Do you read Italian? No. Then I think it's safe to say you don't know what the hell you're talking about. My suggestion to you, Shakespeare, is that you get a copy of the novella, read it in its Italian, then come back to me with your criticisms. Only then can we talk about changes that need to be made to my play. Yes, yes, I understand. Don't be so sensitive. Mr. Edward de Vere, Mr. Earl of Oxford, Mr. Can't change a line of my play. But let me ask you one more question, and then I'll be quiet. It, the speech about the handkerchief, the Egyptian charmer that was a mind reader, is, is the black guy that superstitious? Yes. All right. I am well aware of Black people believing in magic, Black magic, pardon the pun, but does the Italian girl believe in that mumbo jumbo too? You're missing the point. And I think you be, can be forgiven that because of your limited intellectual abilities. I think when you see it on stage, then and only then will you get the sharper understanding of what's going on dramatically in the play. So you like this line. The handkerchief did an Egyptian to my mother give she was a charmer and could almost read the thoughts of people. 
she told her, while she kept it, "'twould make her amiable and subdue my father entirely to her love." Do you really like that line? I love it. I love it. Well, I think you could do better. Just a thought. You might want to think about a rewrite. Shakespeare, stick to drinking and leave the writing to me in bacon. We are the poets. You are an actor that has been blessed with a great opportunity. Enjoy that moment. In a hundred years, we will all be gone and none of this will matter. Try not to mix your knowledge of poetry with my knowledge of structure, character, and blank verse. We are not equals. You're telling me. As a playwright, you don't want to listen to the thoughts of an actor? Precisely. You don't want to know how an actor might feel about a character you've created? I just want you to speak the speech, I pray. You, as I pronounced it to you. For anything so or done is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold as twere the mirror up to nature. And Shakespeare, I abhor the groundlings, who for the most part are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb shows and noise. Agreed? Agreed. Touchy, touchy, touchy. I need another drink and better company. Shakespeare gets up from the table and goes to another part of the tavern. Francis Bacon enters wearing a mask. He carries a leather satchel. He sits at Oxford's table. I see where you got Kit Marlowe to go along with the Rosicutian's death plan. Not in the least. He fought us. He went kicking and screaming into his artificial grave. He didn't agree to die at the cavern brawl? Hell no. I was able to get Ingram, Fraser, Nicholas Skears, and Robert Poley to bring him to Eleanor Bull's house in Deptford, but that is where his cooperation ended. Aren't they also in the service of the Queen's Secret Service? Correct. Thought I might better acquiesce. I thought he might better acquiesce if he were among his friends and see the necessity of the plan. I take it he did not lie down and die. When they told him why they were there, he exploded, screaming, he was at the start of his career. I heard. I heard he was arguing over the bill with Ingram. Ah, please, that was the story we concocted. Lucky for us, Ingram kept his equilibrium and was able to ward off Marlowe's erratic behavior. So, was Kit stabbed? Mm-hmm, over his right eye. Hmm. It was the only way Ingram could stop him. The wound is not life-threatening. The coroner's on the Queen's payroll, William Danby. His report looks official. So where did you ship him off to? Italy. He wanted to go to Venice. Oh. <laughs> but the Italians have him. His emotions will fit nicely with their culture. Do you think he'll stay quiet? Uh, he has no choice. We are arranging for him to continue with his playwriting, using a different name. I thought we would add his plays to Shakespeare's list. That queen is putting uh, Marlowe on salary, too. That's a generous sum. I do not think he will want to ruin his capital income just to expose himself and have assassins looking for him in Venice. Too many Catholics. Uh, what will happen to Ingram Freiser? Is he charged with murder? Yes, but we've arranged for the queen to pardon all three. Ingram, <laughs> Roberts, Nichols. Ingram will be in prison for a month and released. Well... Remind me not to play chess with you. Bacon pulls a script out of his leather <clears throat> satchel. Oxford, I have a script sent to me for Mar from Marlowe, but I think it has problems and needs a rewrite. What's it called? The Merchant of Paris. It's a good read. It's got a Jewish character in it. Oh, what is his fascination with Jews? The Jew of Malta? I asked him about it, but he was evasive. You don't know his heritage, do you? Tell me. <laughs> his father was Jewish. The shoemaker, a Jew? No, his real father, Roger Manwood. Manwood, the judge. Manwood is a Jew. <laughs> a Murano, a Jew living here in secret in England. There are a number of them. Bacon, I know about the Muranos. Did you know that Ro Rodrigo Lopez is a Murano? 
The Queen's physician? There are a number of Maranos in the royal court. Queen likes their counsel, and they live here under her protection. Manwood had an affair with Marlowe's mother. How do you think he was able to pay for his college's education? The Jew, his father, paid for it. Queen knows everything. You amaze me. How do you know all this? Are certain advantages to being part of the Queen's inner circle. Of course, the shoemaker couldn't afford his son to go to college. <laughs> Manwood has been guiding Kit Marlowe's career path from the beginning, with the blessing of the Queen. So Marlowe is a Jew. Eh, technically, no. In the Jewish culture, your mother, mother has to be a Jew. Ah, but what Englishman believes that? Sure. If his daddy's a Jew, then Marlowe's a Jew. In this new play, he has a prominent character who is a Jew, and he asks for a pound of flesh from a non-Jew, a Christian, as a consequence to a business deal. If the borrower cannot pay, he must give up a pound of flesh. Marlowe really hates the French. He's not an enthusiast for French cuisine, either. He complains that they put too much sauce on everything. <laughs> Oxford, he has a scene where the Jew cuts off the merchant's hand. Oh, <laughs> he might as well be writing Titus Andronicus. How's the structure? The structure is sound, but I think you and I should, should do a rewrite. Let's make it Venice instead of Paris as a kind of nod to where he ended up. Connection of Venice. I like that. Salute to all the Rosicrucians, too. What do you want me to rewrite? Mm, he has this bit about gold, silver, and lead. Three suitors come to the girl in the story, Portia, and buy for her hand. Her father has presented them with a riddle. They must solve the riddle to win her hand. Marlowe uses gold as the answer, but that seems too obvious to me. Who are the suitors? The last is, of course, the hero. The first is a prince of Aragon, and the second the prince from Dusseldorf. Ah, I hate Germany. Let's make let's make one of the princes uh, from Morocco. <laughs> I like toying with the idea that maybe the audience will think she's going to have to marry a black man. <laughs> Good idea. <clears throat> I wanted you to work on the gold, silver, and lead theme. The three suitors have three choices as to which precious metals represent the love of their of his future bride. Marlowe wrote gold, but we can be a little more clever than that. I'd like you to use your wit. Can you, can you find a way to make it lead and make it poetic? Let the suitor figure out how the lead represents true love. Make it flowery. Bacon hands Oxford's a few pages from the manuscript. It's a nice challenge, Bacon. And there is a section that I need help with. Yes. Uh, there's this courtroom scene, and the lawyer defends the merchant. I'm thinking of having the character Portia masquerade as a man. She will be the lawyer. She, he defends the merchant in the courtroom and uses the law to save his pound of flesh. If the woman defends the man, it will create a nice tension. She might not be smart enough to win. And you need help with how the law can work in his favor? No, I solved that problem. No, I have a nice plot twist, too. In a love scene, she gives her lover, Bassanio, a ring, and he swears he'll never take it off. But he gives the ring to the lawyer, which is really her. Too obvious? No, not at all. You told me there's a twist, though. Nice dramatic moment. Maybe we can add some humor, too. Mm. It's given as payment. Before the trial? No, after the trial. So the Jew does not get his pound of flesh. The hero is obligated to give something of value to the lawyer. Uh, that works. I, I like that. I also want to send a message to the queen. What kind of message? A message of mercy. Right now in the royal court, she is in an awkward position. Lord Burley is pressuring her to be strong and cr cruel. I think she should be merciful. Oh... Um... The Spanish incident. Yes. Well, let's write a speech about the qualities of mercy. 
where the quality of mercy is not strained drops like rain now it droppeth as the gentle rain blank verse my friend <laughs> worse from heaven it droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven yes yes good very good let's use heaven as a metaphor then it droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place below upon the place beneath it's twice blessed it blesses him that gives and him that takes tis mightiest in the mightiest it becomes the throne monarch better than her crown better than his crown uh, we don't want to be too obvious <laughs> mm. wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings but mercy is above this sceptered sway. No, no, wait, wait. Listen to this. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is the attribute of God himself. And earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. Excellent, Oxford, excellent. If we do this right, the queen cannot help but be moved. The merchant of Venice. <laughs> I, I know some things about that city I can add to the script. It will give it more of an Italian flavor. I used to ask every morning, what is the news on the Rialto? <laughs> nice touch. Well, here are the rest of the pages for the gold, silver, and lead scene. Bacon hands some pages to Oxford. Oxford looks at the pages and figures out what he wants to say. Thanks. Uh, we'll put Shakespeare's name on this. But let's not show it to him until we're ready to go in production. I'll write Marlowe and let him know what we're doing. Lights fade to black. Scene two. Shakespeare enters. He is elated. What a day! What a day! What a performance! Oxford It was the best opening ever! Enjoyed yourself, didn't you? Ben Johnson came up to me and complimented me on my sense of humor. He said he loved all the funny lines. Ben Johnson, he's my new best friend. Good feeling. He kept quoting the line, uh, Satan come forth, and he'd laugh and say, great line. Heady, heady feeling. I must admit I had my doubts about the fourth act, but it all came together beautifully. Oxford, you are a very funny guy. Uh, Dromeo? <laughs> Simply priceless. Which one? Both. Comedy of errors. Uh, promise me you'll publish it under my name. Guaranteed. Ah, uh, love it, love it, love it. Uh, an actor came up to me and introduced himself, looking for a job, wants me to consider him for the next play. Who? Uh, some guy named Richard Burbage. He kept insisting he was a wonderful actor. What did you say? Well, I told him that I thought he might be a robustious periwig-pated fellow. I, I asked, would he tear a passion to tatters to very rags? And his answer? Only if I want him to. <laughs> I like that, robustious periwig-pated fellow. Oh, we should put that in a future play. By the way, this letter came for you at the theater. Oxford hands Shakespeare a letter. He reads it and frowns. Bad news? Well, my son is sick. Damn, my wife. I've never seen you bring your son around the theater. Where do they live? Oxford, I'm from a place called Stratford-upon-Avon. A small town, a hamlet, really. I left when I was 21, just headed out looking for fame, fortune, and new adventures. Every young man's dream. When I was that age, I was traveling Europe. The trick is not to have children before you realize what you want to do. What do you have? Boys? Girls? I've got a daughter, Susanna, and a set of twins. No, not like Dromeo, a, a boy and a girl. Hamnet and Judith. Sweetest children ever. Miss them? Let's just say their mom makes it hard for me to return as often as, as, as I would like. But you're a noble man, so you don't have to deal with a shrew. An evil woman doesn't know class distinction. A sour woman is not class specific. Any man can latch on to the wrong woman at any time. 
I went looking for adventure as a young man to France and Italy. As I traveled abroad, I was sent word that my wife was pregnant. At first I was ecstatic till I, till I did the math. Oxford. I'm 17 years old and I had never seen a woman's naked breast. She was 25 and willing to let me touch her breast in the bright light of the sun, not the soft shadowy candlelight of the night, but free as you please in the daylight. And then she would let me watch those lovely pink nipples rise. 17 years old. What should I do? I couldn't wait to bury my passion in her treasure. My God, Oxford, the feeling of my first orgasm at 17. She was not a virgin, nor did I care. I just knew the feeling I was experiencing made everyday life special. She led me to an unknown land and I was happy to be there, but she was 25, I was 17. Do you think she took advantage of the situation? It is not till after you are married that you replay that scenario in your head, then you realize that maybe, just maybe an older woman knows how to manipulate the young boy. Six months after our vows, my daughter, Susanna, arrived. What's your wife's name? Anne. <laughs> my wife's name is Anne. Is your Anne a bitch? Oh, most certainly. Do you think being a bitch is peculiar to women named Anne? No, no, not in the least. My mistress is also named Anne. <sighs> well, that's a hell of a coincidence. I suggest to you, Shakespeare, if you must have a mistress, make sure she has the same name as your wife. Less complications remembering who you're with. I'll make note of that. The good news is you know you are the father of your children. Every time I look at Elizabeth's face, I do not see my face or my wife's. But you are a gentleman, an earl, the Earl of Oxford. You have money and position. You can do what you want. I am ruled by the lack of money. Before the marriage, my dreams were important. After the wedding, all I was told, you now have a family. You can't do that. She crushed every idea or dream I had and replaced it with the word obligation. I believe most wives are lesbians. You do. Why else would they turn their husband into a pussy? I was caught in a bear trap. I needed to find a way out without chewing off my leg. If I stayed, she would crush my spirit. So how did you escape? When I turned 21, that was the magic year, I poached a deer from the estate of Thomas Lucy. Then before I could be brought to trial, I convinced Anne I had to leave. I left home hearth and heartache. And came to London to seek my fortune in the big city. I did not want to be a big fish in a little pond. I, I wanted to swim with the strong fish and test my mettle. She told me many times I would never make anything of myself. I was not man enough to deal with the real world. Mark my words, you'll come running home to the comfort of my arms. I was a child with wild fantasies. But you didn't return. I know it wasn't easy. Why did you stick it out here? Two years after I left, I was so low, I did not know where I would sleep or where my next meal would come from, but I was determined not to prove her right. Sometimes I think you need someone who doesn't believe in you to give you the strength to keep fighting. You survived. I'd rather hold horses in front of a London theater for one night than be a year-round constable in Stratford-upon-Avon. Bacon enters the tavern. He sits with Shakespeare and Oxford. Shakespeare, glad you're here. Oxford, I want you to listen to this and tell me what you think. What is it? A speech from my new play. Ah, what's the premise? Listen, and I will fill you in after you hear what I've written. This is a lord talking to a lady. Well, what did he do to her? He lied, and so did his friends. Lie to her friends. So he's uh, 
trying to beg forgiveness for everybody. Shakespeare, just listen. <clears throat> Honest plain words best peer the, pierce the ear of grief. And by these badges understand the king, for your fair sakes have we neglected time, played foul play with our oaths. Your beauty, ladies, have much deformed us, fashioning our humor even to the opposed end of our intents. And what in us had seemed ridiculous is full of unbefitting strains, all wanton as a child, skipping in vain. Clever rhyme. Let me finish. Formed by the eye, <clears throat> and therefore like the eye, full of strange shapes of habits and of forms, varying in subjects as the eye doth roll to every varied object in his glance, which party-coated presence of loose love put on by us, if in your heavenly eyes have misbecomed our oaths and gravities, those heavenly eyes that look into these faults suggested us to make. Brilliant use of eyes, Bacon, brilliant. Not done, Shakespeare. Therefore, ladies, our love being yours, the error that love makes is likewise yours. We to ourselves prove false by being once false, forever to be true to those that make us both. Fair ladies, you, and even that a falsehood, in itself a sin thus, purifies itself and turns to grace. That's beautiful. I like it, Bacon. I think it sounds beautiful, but you should have a couplet that rhymes with sin at the end, something like, uh, and even that a falsehood in itself a sin, one kiss from you is all I need to win. The speech is in the middle of the scene. We, we save couplets for the end of the scene. Then all that talk, I just don't get it. Maybe you have to see it mounted. Maybe. Don't worry, it will, it will all become clear soon. This is the next play we are gonna do. So my name will go on this? Yes, of course. So what kind of play is this? It's a love story. Three noblemen promise their king they will be celibate. Well, how can it be a love story if the men promise to be celibate? They promise the king they'll be celibate for three years, then, a princess and three lovely ladies show up in the kingdom. And the men labor for their love. Uh, they labor for love? They're mm -hmm. celibate? That sounds like love's labor loss. I, I hope this is a comedy. It, a comedy with wit, wordplay, and wasted love. Have you heard of the poet Sir Philip Sidney? The author of The Countess of Pembroke's Arcania? Mm -hmm. The queen loves his writing. And I've written a play which is a nod to his genius. Sydney's ability to use words in a creative way. And the first performance of this play will be this Christmas in the Royal Court. Shakespeare, would you like to meet the queen? If only my wife could hear what you just asked. Yes, a thousand times, yes. We will introduce you to her as the author of this play. Me, standing in the royal court, rubbing elbows with the elite? You won't be as impressed when you actually meet them. Uh, Oxford, do you have a play that you are working on? I'm working on a play that'll have fairies interacting with humans. I want to play with the idea that, of fairies and a world colliding with reality in our world. Uh, wait, 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 wait. You want fairies interacting with humans? And maybe have a worker being seduced by a fairy queen. Uh, hold it, hold it, hold it. A queen makes love to a common man? Yes. Well, how is that going to work? Fairies and humans talking to each other? Yes. It's in Athens, a Greek comedy. That's good. And since most men are asses, the common man will have the head of an ass when the queen makes love to him. She's hitting rock bottom. <laughs> All men are not asses. His name will be Rock Bottom. But just call him Rock. Just, just call him Bottom. <laughs> so Bottom, who has the face of an ass, makes love to a fairy queen? How does that happen? I don't know. 
That's what I'm working on. Make it a dream. I've had dreams like that. Wet dreams? <laughs> yes, of course. So a bottom gets made love to by a fairy in Greece? Essentially. I also want, I also want to do play within a play, the lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. What is this masterpiece called? I don't have a title for it yet. How about A Midnight Dream in Athens? Maybe. <laughs> At this rate, we will have a play every year for the next 20 years. Ah, and we have one more playwright we'd like you to front for. Well, do I know him? No. He, he's our friend, but he's out of the country. He's an Englishman and wants to get his plays done here, even though he's away. Well, that's odd. Uh, what, what's his name? Shakespeare, part of this arrangement is that where we can keep the secrets, we must keep them. I cannot tell you his name. You must trust that we like his playwriting and that he has important things to say. We promised we'd help him get his plays produced. We went to Italy and fell in love with the country, the cuisine, people. The religion. He's Catholic, isn't he? He can't practice his religion here because of the queen, right? Oh, can't get anything past you, Shakespeare. I understand politics. We told him about you, and if he can have an alias, he can write freely and not worry about censorship. I'll agree, as long as he doesn't say anything against Protestants and the Queen. I, I don't want my head on a platter. We'll let you read every word before it's spoken on stage. Plus, we are going to increase your payment. It'll be worth it. Your name will become the banner for good theater. Trust us, Shakespeare. This guy is a good writer. I feel like I should know this man, an English playwright. Are, are you sure I don't know him? Positive. Absolutely. Well, does he have a new play he wants done here? Yes, he sent me the first draft of a new script. Oh, he did? Huh. Yes. What's the premise? Since being in Italy, he's gotten into the customs and the culture of the country and He's discovered an old Italian legend, which he, he wants to turn into a play. Which old Italian legend? He's written a play about Romeo and Juliet. Oh, that's been done and redone and overdone. Surely he can't be serious. Trust me, he's serious, and I don't think he'd be talked out of it. Well, Shakespeare, I, I don't think you'll have to worry about offending Protestants and the Queen. Good. Just boring a few theater patrons. Actually, he's got quite a nice view on it. And he's given Romeo a best friend, Mercutio, quite flamboyant. I think the character is a scene stealer. Well, I have to read it before I buy it. We all will. But the blind nurse is exceptional. And he asked me if I would contact Edward Allen to play Mercutio. Well, isn't he uh, Marlowe's man? Since Marlowe's dead, I'm sure he won't mind being employed by us. Well, is there a role in the play for me? Actually, there is. Romeo's confidant, Friar Lawrence. Then I'm good. This calls for a celebration. We got a triumph in Love's Labor Lost. We've got venues to present our works and a way to keep our anonymity. And I've got a way to make a living in the theater. They all toast with their glasses. To the theater. To the theater. Blackout. End of play. Thank you so much for joining us today for Shakespeare Over My Shoulder, featuring Daniel Barrett, Steve Ducey, Gordon Goodman, Stefan Spiegel, and Mary Land. Written by Ted Land. And we're so excited. Congratulations, everyone. And thank you so much for being here. We now are going to move into our moderated critique session. This is an opportunity for you to give positive and constructive feedback to the playwright and the, and the actors as well. 
You can do this by raising your hand and actually coming on the mic. It is the raise your hand feature is at the bottom of the toolbar in the reactions button. And you are also able to put comments and put questions in the Q&A or the chat function. So now I'd like to bring Ted, Mary, and Gar Garland Thompson <laughs> to the stage. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, welcome. Ted, how are you? How are you doing with your with your watching your watching and listening your your play? I just love those actors, uh, Gordon, Stefan, Steve, and Daniel. They're just wonderful actors, and I thought they did a wonderful job of uh, portraying the characters. And they were all unique. So uh, at the same time, um, I just. Uh, I just really, really enjoyed it. Should they come? Should we bring them back? Please, please, actors, Gordon, Steve, Stefan, Daniel. There they so are. Much there for, they are. And we we encourage uh, audience members if you have anything you'd like to say, please raise your hand. We can get you on the mic, or you can put it into the comments or the uh, Q and A section, and I can just field those. Garland, did you want to make any comments? Well, yes, I want to say uh, absolutely congratulations, Ted. This is um, this is a wonderful piece of work. Uh, I I really enjoyed reading it before you know before we uh, decided to do this reading, and I just um, I love the wordplay and the wittiness of it, and the interweaving of all the various elements from Shakespeare's plays that we all know so well. Yeah. And how the how they come up with the titles and everything. It's it's really a lovely, a lovely piece of work. Um, Let me I, just say this also, the the facts about Marlowe and Bacon and DeVere working those in so that it's not just exposition, but it's characterization. Mm -hmm. uh, I was watching that this time around, and these guys did a great, great job. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Absolutely. My hat's off to all the actors. All of you did a wonderful job, and Ted was very right. All of you brought such wonderful, unique characteristics to all of your characters there. Um, I'd love to hear, we have a couple of folks in the audience, so I hope that uh, the folks in the audience aren't, aren't shy, but we'd also love to hear any comments from the actors, though, because what we're here to do, part of why we're doing this reading, is to help give Ted, the writer, uh, some some constructive feedback, some some to the words that he's that he's written, and you know it's it, it's exciting to me in a number of in a number of, of ways. Ted's got his pencil; he's ready to go, um, and I think it's just uh, I, I think it's lovely. One of the things that definitely strikes me is you know uh, technically the Frank Silvera Writers Workshop is we are dedicated to. Um, to uh, uh, developing and developing and producing new works by by African American playwrights, of which Ted, of course, is one. But to see normally our plays are all they're filled with African American characters, they're African American stories. So to see a writer of color take on Shakespeare and take on these characters, and then to hear the characters talk about race also, I think it was just uh, it, it was just wonderful. We ha I see we've got something in that we've got. Yeah, we have a, a comment and a question, a comment from Greta. Greta, thank you so much. She's, uh, Greta says, fun and funny. Why did you start with Shakespeare and change to Shakespeare? Uh, I belong to a society called the Shakespeare Round Table. And uh, part of the theory there is that his name was actually Shakespeare and then it was changed to Shakespeare. So I tried to figure out a way to work that in. Uh, there are a couple of uh, people like Mark Roylance is a, a, what you call a Devere man and uh, Derek Jacobi. These are Englishmen that all believe that Shakespeare didn't write the plays that they were written by someone else. And I did a lecture for that society in Hartford, Connecticut on Othello. And uh, after that lecture, 
the writers that were there, the scholars that were there gave me all of these books about the situation, about Shakespeare becoming Shakespeare, about the poem um, in which the queen is really represented in the poem and that, uh, so they gave me a lot of information that I then tried to work into the play. And, uh, and then while I was doing, I decided to add Marlowe and I was in, I was at Ohio State University directing a play and they have a fantastic library. And I went to the library and asked, do you have any books on Marlowe? And there are a lot of books on Marlowe that it was a conspiracy. Not only that, but they named the boat that they, they shoved him out on. They, they broke down how the uh, supposed killing actually happened and that he was a spy for the queen and the Privy Council was trying to kill him off. All of that's true according to these different books. So I just tried to figure out a way to work in the information in a theatrical way so that uh, uh, the audience gets another side to the controversy and at the same time that it's hopefully entertaining and humorous. So that's what I did. Uh, uh, but if you go out, you can, you can find books about Marlowe not dying in that brawl and you can find books about Shakespeare becoming Shakespeare. There, there are books out there. Um, and I, I, I don't have the titles of some of the books. I wish I had it at hand. I would give you some of the titles. But I think that if you, you know, Google or Zoom, you can find some of these, um, some of these books. It's a fascinating, fascinating subject. It's definitely a great debate. I, I've worked with an, with an Edward de Vere man myself, who's a producer of a theater company in California and uh, who's spoken a lot on this, on this uh, subject as well. Greta, I'd like to ask you, how did it work for you? How did this piece work for you? How did, did, did you buy him being Shakespeare, Shakespeare turning into Shakespeare? How did, did that work for you? And feel free to come on the mic and, and let us know uh, let us know how you feel. Um, and also, if any of the other actors, if any of the actors would like to comment on how this, uh, how this story worked. Did it work for you? Did it, did it, did it ring with some kind of truthfulness that, that, that seemed, that seemed worthy? Ready? You out there? Or any of the actors, if you guys want to jump in, feel free. <laughs> okay. No, I'll jump in. I'll jump in. Okay, um, go ahead, Gordon. There was there was so much politics going on at this time. Uh, Ted was talking to me about this about Marlowe some time ago, um, and it blew me away that he was a, a spy. But there was stuff going on. All um, wasn't it, Ted? You were also telling me about um, D'Artagnan. Mm -hmm. I think was also uh, there was he went to England and kidnapped someone and brought him back in a wine barrel. Weren't you telling me? So, well, that, yeah, is that correct? Well, there, there are things in Hamlet that actually happened to De Vere. So if you read Hamlet, there's a whole section there where uh, Hamlet is kidnapped by pirates. That actually happened to De Vere and dropped off on the shore. I, I don't know if any of you remember that, but that's one of the things is that it's so long ago and uh, we, you know, things change and we don't get the information. So for instance, Shakespeare never left England, yet he wrote this play, Othello, yet De Vere left England and, uh, was bought the book of the novella and that novella never came to English shores. The, and everyone puts on it that it was the Italian translation, but no one ever questions the fact, how did Shakespeare 
get this book if the book never came to England. Mm -hmm. The book was never in England. It was in Italy. It was a popular book in Italy. Uh, and then when I started doing the thing about the women that um, uh, the women were not on stage in England and I had an actress who was very familiar with this and that was because of the church. Mm -hmm. The church would not let the English put women on stage, but in Italy where the Catholic church is, they didn't have a problem with it, you know? So, and it had been going on for 30 years. Well, that's all that kind of stuff really fascinated me. And so then my job is to figure out how can I weave this stuff into the play so that it happens organically, you know, so that the audience is not only entertained, but they're educated on the situation. Mm -hmm. Greta says that it did it worked uh, a beat, but I believe she means best. It, it worked best, and she thought it also it worked beautifully, and that she knew some of these some of these situations, but not all. And I'm I'm curious um, for our two actors who are with us here. Um, how did it How did it ring to you as you were as you were performing it? Because it's very ironic that that Shakespeare, an actor, is is questioning De Beers not wanting to listen to what an actor thinks. So what what do our actors think? Well, I, I was just gonna say I think I think the the change of name is so important because it 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 shows the the fact that that Shakespeare was a young actor who was so hungry to do this and all of a sudden his name becomes the most important thing. It's it's the way to get all this work across and it changes everything and I think for him and his journey for the two acts it's it's just very instrumental to see him going from I just want a part I just want your attention to everything is through his name and it's this huge opportunity and it's I mean it's 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 fun to play and I think it it, it really helps me to I'm Shakespeare and now I've graduated to Shakespeare. It's 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 very fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. Gordon, how how did you feel um, <clears throat> doing a wonderful De Vere and and also we have our uh, we have our man uh, Bacon with us. How, how did it how did it work for you guys? Well, <laughs> it's great to have a patsy, <laughs> and and what's even more what's even more fun is when the patsy starts to get so much power that it backfires. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the real comedy of the piece. Absolutely. And what does our other our other our, our Francis our bacon say about this? Yeah, I mean, I think it worked fant I mean, if you're gonna buy into the whole story and you're not mm -hmm. gonna be one of those people who, you know, will just disregard it because of that storyline in itself i think if you're buying into the story then it it's, it works great i think it works mm -hmm. fantastic mm -hmm. Actually, i love well, the way you did it mr Ducey, who was mr who was our, our christopher marlowe how, how do you how do you feel about it how did it work for you and what would you say i mean once i'm dead i just i stopped paying attention so no, i'm just <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, I, I, you know, I just, I, I love, you know, having worked with Ted on a bunch of different shows, and and the first piece that I did with him was 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 a historical piece, and you know, not knowing his love of Shakespeare, and uh, and now having uh, had the experience of that, and getting exposed to the authorship question through him, which was something that like I found so fascinating as somebody who, you know, studied theater and and you know was in Shakespeare plays before, and never thought once or twice about this sort of thing. Um, I do love the, the the playful way that he takes all of this stuff that, you know, if you have done any reading about the authorship question uh, and just weaves it in in such a way uh, that is, you know, both like uh, informative, but also entertaining. Uh, and, you know, uh, it couldn't be further from the truth in terms of like the, the people that he's writing in this play. Ted is a very collaborative director um, and he works so well with his actors uh that you know it's definitely him stretching his uh uh his uh his creativity to to write characters who are so belittling of actors 
<laughs> a true irony right there. Uh, a, a definitely a true irony. Greta, feel free to weigh in on, on this uh, on, on this as well. Um, it was, uh, you know, it was ironic that, you know, uh, construction wise, though, uh, there were some things I felt. Number one, I feel like I feel like it could have it could have gone a little longer. There could have been a little bit more. And I actually personally, I, I kind of wanted to see. But and, I, and I'm not sure I'm wrangling with whether it would work or not. I actually wanted to see Marlowe again somehow in some form or fashion. You know, and I as an, as an actor, I would say yes. Put me on stage, Mark, please. Yeah. <laughs> of course, of course. But see, I don't know. Like I said I'm wrestling with the idea. I mean, one way, of course, would be to show the bar scene, the setup, this, the you know, the fake death, and all of that, and to see him kicking and screaming. I'm not sure. I'm wrestling with the idea because it would. I just wanted more. I think in general, you know, you know I'm what I'm thinking, Garland. Mm. Is if he smuggles himself back into England. Mm. Now that you're... might be interesting. And he can know, wear those beak, those beak masks. Yeah, the beak things, oh, right? Oh, yes. yes. It's something not, we haven't if talked. If he comes back, that would be, to me, that would be interesting. If Marlowe comes back undercover mm -hmm. to see his play, and be pissed off about something in the play. I was just about to say that. And he, he goes to Shakespeare and somehow has some interaction with him. Yeah. And he's trying to give him advice or something. Or even, even if Shakespeare then realizes, like, he says, I should know this guy. Who is this guy? And these mm -hmm. two guys won't tell him. And, and then the take guy shows off. up. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that might be very interesting. That might be a very interesting, Marlowe returns. Anyway, uh, there, there could be something in that when the guy's supposed to stay dead, mm -hmm. you know. But he doesn't. He, stay dead. he can't stay dead because his, I mean, we, it's, it would fit right in line with his character because he's such a hothead and he wants to be known. And he's because, arrogant. He's wonderfully he, arrogant. He's and arrogant, but... But it would be interesting if he um, he realizes that he, at the peril of his own life he cannot come out again. He can't. He has to yeah. stay undercover. But somehow he's got to figure a way to get his his angle in there. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So yeah. that might be something fun to play with, which yeah, would yeah, also that, add a little. That's bit a good consideration. Thing. That's a mm -hmm. really good consideration. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, um, doing that also plays into. Shakespeare doing those and that, you know, fake deaths and who's dead and people coming back alive, that mm -hmm. would fit into that as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I can use it. I can use it. You know? Absolutely. You, you could. Know, and in you fact, know. it would be interesting character development to add to him, which you've already kind of got him on the track in that he starts to somehow piece it together himself and kind of realize, wait a minute, these guys, they're not telling me everything. I know this guy, maybe he recognizes the work because he's a fan of Marlowe's plays. And he goes, wait a minute, hold on a second. But maybe he understands that, okay, I can't blow this thing because if I, if I blow this wide open, then I'm out of a job. Yeah, I'm, I lose you know, money. Yeah. I lose money and all that. And he decides to go on. I mean, you know, you could, I think there's stuff there for you to play with. Greta says in the chat, she says, yes, it would be exclamation point. Yes, it would be wonderful if they attack Shakespeare for stealing their plays. Um, oh, she says she can't find her microphone, so <laughs> she'd love to talk. It's in there. Look for the little microphone icon, Greta. We'd love to hear your voice in this. But um, Greta, if you go down to your toolbar, there should you'll see a reactions button or you should or you might. And that's Far where you left. find the microphone. Yeah, the yes. far left corner. Yes, yes, but see, there's some there's some really interesting ideas, you know, to 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 play with right there. Um, I just I just feel after you know when I first read it, uh, I I got to the end and I was really feeling like I wanted more. There was just I mean, not necessarily another three acts, but I just wanted some more. No, no, I, so, no I I think I get what you're saying. Yeah, because mm -hmm. it's short. This is a short play. Yes. And it, it yes. wouldn't hurt to have a little more length to it. And then to to go into something with these guys in their characterizations, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you have 
uh, Bacon trying to hide the guy and he doesn't want to hide. Mm -hmm. And you have mm -hmm. Devere dealing with, the, you know, the fluidity of the play that was written, you know, mm -hmm. and Marlowe saying, you took out my so-and-so scene. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's some wonderful... Well, how did you know we took it? I was in the theater. I was up in the balcony in the back. Of the, you know, there, right. there's some good possibilities in there. Sure, him confronting him confronting uh, Marlo, him confronting Bacon and Devere. Greta's got yeah. her hand up. I think Greta's figured I, out her microphone. So let's hear I from Greta. So. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hello. Should, should I do full disclosure here or not? Yes, yet? you should. Absolutely. Full, full disclosure, I, I'm a huge fan of Daniel Barrett, and I also am related to him. <laughs> but um, you're all wonderful. And I've known uh, Ted's work for a long time because my brother is Victor Berman, who uh, I think... Um, I think he delivered your baby, isn't that true? Both, both of my sons. Wow. My goodness. So wow. um, this is full disclosure, but uh, despite or in addition to all of that, I really, I found myself laughing. I thought it was clever. Mm -hmm. I thought it was um, not overstated. You didn't turn to slapstick or silliness. It was all you know, intelligent, you had to think about it. And I think it really worked, bravo. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. My Thank actors, you. those are the actors. Absolutely, they, they really brought it to life. It, it's interesting because it strikes me as you could actually use pieces of Shakespeare's plot almost, you know, weave it into the piece that these guys are actually experiencing it. And because you already started going down that road with them, that's why this is in here because this they experienced this, you know. Um, so it's actually kind of pulling from real life, as as it were, and and they all end up working together to pull this whole thing off. Yeah. Right. Which is yeah. what they would really have to do to pull it off. Right. Yeah. 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 So. Oh, I think here comes Marlo back. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting more Marlowe right now I feel like I'm part of it uh this is terrific I the other full disclosure I teach at Juilliard so I teach actors but I don't teach acting mm. so therefore I feel very comfortable among actors and theater people mm. Thank Wonderful. You. Well, we're very appreciative that you're here, Greta, and you know your perspective as a, as an audience member. Just hearing this for the first time is is very very important. Thank um, you. It was delightful, really mm, delightful. Wonderful. How do you feel about some of the things that we've said uh, so far about you know uh, I've said a lot about wanting more and et cetera. How, how do you feel about some of these things we've discussed so far? Oh, I agree. I, I mean, it was, I, I mean, and I think that's a compliment. It was too short. I wanted mm -hmm. it to go on. I want to know mm -hmm. what happened then and so on. Mm -hmm. I see Daniel wants to say yes, something. Yes, Daniel. Yeah, I was, I was, thank you for watching, by the way. Um, <laughs> and I was just going to say, uh, Ted, this is kind of a question for you. In, a, in an earlier draft, there was um, some, at the, at the beginning of the show, there was some audition, auditioning that was happening from Shakespeare, where he was kind of presenting his work as an actor, trying to kind of get the approval. And I know it's not in this draft, and it was a lot of fun to do. And I'm, and just speaking too about, about us all being actors and kind of the parallels, I wonder, I know it's just the four of us, but I wonder if there's ever any opportunities to see a glimpse of a rehearsal or, you know, yelling at the actors off stage, something to kind of include uh, the fact that they're present, even though they're not literally present. I'm curious your thoughts about that. Well, uh, you know what, I, I think we can do it. We could do something like that in the uh, tavern, because I want to keep one set. I don't want to, you know, have to do another set and da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, there might be something with a piece that he's rehearsed and he keeps getting interrupted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, he's there to show these guys how good he is, but he keeps getting interrupted or something stops him from completing his audition. But I'd like to keep, and you've seen people do that where they they see an opportunity and they won't let the guy get away and they, they maybe cross the line a little bit. Mm-hmm. So if, a, if an actor is hungry enough, mm-hmm. um, I think that might be something that could apply. Because we, I know actors like that, you know, you know, mm-hmm. when am I going to meet Alec Baldwin again? He may need somebody, you know, when am I going to mm-hmm. see uh, Spielberg again? And he does it. A, a, a friend of mine, uh, uh, Debbie Allen, the reason Spielberg did uh, the slave movie, you know, Debbie Allen, right? Mm-hmm. What was the name of the, the slave movie uh, about the ship? Oh, uh, Amistad. 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 Mm-hmm. He saw Spielberg in a restaurant. And just and went up to him. to him. And did the whole nine yards. And he said, okay, send me the script. <laughs> That's how that happened. And if you ever watch the movie, she gets credited as one of the producers. Wow. In Amistad. There you have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you have it. Uh, art yeah, imitating so that, life, that, life imitating art. Yeah, that fits right into being in a tavern, being in the presence of someone that's more powerful than you that could maybe help your career. Mm, that's so, right. Yeah, I think maybe that Shakespeare would have a, and that would be fun to direct that Shakespeare has a piece that he wants to do. To do, right, yeah. Yeah, right. And right. it'll, be, it'll be a Marlowe play. I'll take, you know, the Jew of Malta or something like that. By the way, Marlowe was, that's all true about the, the, the guy making love to the wife, mm-hmm. Marlowe's mom, mm-hmm. and then he was part Jewish. That's mm-hmm. true. Mm-hmm. That's all mm-hmm. true. That's in one of the books that I read. There's some really rich things that you could that you could draw upon still, I think, and you know, without it becoming bloated or anything like that, because you don't want it to get to that kind of point. But I think there's still there's room for this to grow. And I mean, even with the tavern, I'm thinking the one set is great. Maybe the tavern is where some of these, maybe this is where the rehearsal took place or a rehearsal or something, yeah, yeah. you know, took place in the after hours, you know, the tavern keeper has allowed them to use it or they paid them to use the space after hours. And so, you know, I, I just think, I think there's so many possibilities here. Yeah, there really are good possibilities. Possibilities. it does feel like a one act piece right now, not a two act piece. Yeah. You know, right now it's so, I mean, maybe you can even do uh, the play that was successful in Shakespeare trying to be one of the twins. You know, mm. there, there's possibilities, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that Absolutely. could happen. That can happen. I can find one of the speeches from the um uh, from the actual play love labor's lost or whatever well yeah i think that you do have the opportunity to quote you know to in a very tactical way strategic way to quote some of the things that we already know so well which yeah. also gives us more of a subway strap if you will to hang on to with it you know what i mean yeah. and to take this ride yeah okay so there's some really, there's some, I think there's some good stuff in there for you. Um, yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm, absolutely. That's very good. Very good. And I, I, and as I was watching it, Garland, you and I talked about the ending that's kind of abrupt and I was watching yes. away. I took that into consideration as I watched it this time for maybe there's another way to end it. That's more satisfying. Well, you know, it's interesting because I like them toasting. I think that's great. I think the road there, though, is too short. Right. That's what I'm saying. That's what I was looking at. I agree. Yeah. 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 So the build up to it, how we get there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So Mm -hmm. I think that maybe it's they're looking for something to toast to. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. let's toast to the play. No, let's toast to the actor. No, let's toast to... The few, you know, and then it comes mm-hmm. around to the theater. Mm-hmm. But you have to, you have to build that in before you get to the end. Yeah, right, 
Right. Yeah. They, that's it. Did the it, that's what I think is making it feel a little bit abrupt right now is because we yeah. don't have enough of a runway for it. Yeah. And, um, for that plane to take off. Yeah. Exactly. So, and and you know and I love it because I could see you know I use the metaphor of a plane taking off. To me, that's like the them reaching that point where they agree and they toast is like the plane taking off because in my mind I could see oh my god they go on for years now. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, and the, we end up with this incredible canon of work. Yeah, well, the great, the great line is, listen, we'll be dead in 100 years. Nobody's going to care. Yeah, <laughs> right. And right, we're right, still right. doing the guy's play, so. Right, exactly, exactly. There's, there was another uh, point, too. Um, Bacon comes in and he immediately um, starts telling Marlo that he's got to die. Mm -hmm. And... Um, mm that felt a little fast to me mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. um i mean if they were good friends um i get the feeling that bacon might come in pissed at marlo for being so stupid about something mm. well there, then, there's an incident i could uh, dramatize the incident which pushed it over and the privy council is now going after him and then come to the conclusion there rather than beforehand that man, we gotta fake your death. Yeah, we gotta yeah, get you out of here. Some right. you're gonna. But he's, but he's being sent by the queen. Oh, he is. Uh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's a way to work. Maybe there's a way to work in more of a sense of danger because what these guys are doing is really dangerous. If if they were found out, I mean, that could be the end of all of it. Well, right? I mean, the, the whole thing was about Catholics and Protestants in England. Mm -hmm. There's a film, if you ever get a chance to see it, called Gunpowder. I mm. don't know if you know that, the guy from um, Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. And he's the one, Guy Fawkes, you know about Guy Fawkes and Guy Fawkes yep. Day, and they were going to yep. blow up the parliament on opening day. And, but that all has to do with Catholics and Protestants. And mm -hmm. that's what Marlowe was doing. Marlowe was a spy for the Protestants against the Catholics. <laughs> Mm. And so uh, uh, that's all part of what that is. I didn't go into it really deeply, but maybe I it can stand to be um, examined again, you know? Yeah, a little, maybe a little bit further. Maybe you don't have to go into it so deep, but maybe give us a little bit more of that kind of exposition to help us yeah. out there. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, I don't want to. I don't want to keep us here forever. I know the folks are, are getting tired, and folks, it, it's 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 late somewhere. And where it is, I, I'm actually believe it or not, it's almost two a.m. where I'm at. I'm actually. Oh my in, gosh. Yeah, I'm actually in London right now. So. Wow! It's, oh, wow! Amazing! So it's, Isn't this yeah, great so it's, that we can do this? Yeah. I just yep. love this. Yeah. It's fantastic, and I just it's ironic to me that I'm actually in London helping to work on a play that is set in London. <laughs> oh, funny. So I know, so I know it's that, and I have to get up pretty early in the morning too for work, but um, okay. so I don't want to keep us, but is there any final, in closing, is there any final thoughts, all of you, about, yeah, I'll throw the mic to all of you um, to give us any final thoughts. Uh, Greta, please feel free to give us any final thoughts. Um, and Ted, we'll, we'll let you have the last word on it. Gentlemen, just thanks to everybody. It was fun. Thanks, Ted. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Bye. Carlin. Thank you. My pleasure, gentlemen. My pleasure. Once, once again, my hats off to you. All of you are wonderful, wonderful actors, and you really brought this piece to life for us tonight. So, um, my hats off to you. My, my, my thanks to all of you for the great work that you put in tonight. Yes, thank you all. I mean, I just love these guys work and every time i have something i like to call these guys because i know they're going to do the work mm -hmm. so uh thank you once again for your great uh, talent and for making my words sing <laughs> mm -hmm. indeed and i look i look forward to seeing this play up on its feet and i look forward to seeing you actors on your feet doing this play for real yeah yeah so absolutely. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna keep keep uh, commiserating on that and keep putting that out there to the universe to make that happen. Okay, that Thank you so much, everyone, for being here with us tonight. Thanks for joining. Uh,
Yes, thanks for joining. I'm, my name is Garland Thompson. I'm the artif executive artistic director of the Frank Silvera Writers Workshop. Um, feel free to check us out. And uh, gentlemen, if you have any, any plays or playwrights or anybody you want to recommend to us, please feel free. Nice to meet you. Thanks so much. Thank Absolutely. you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Good evening.